All right, so we're going to be talking about chapter 24, finishing off this unit for history. So I'm just getting to the audio for this one. It starts off with our theme verse, Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. This says, remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. So this theme verse shows us God's role in history, how he has already foretold many things that will happen in history, that he is in control of all of history, and that, like it says there at the end, my counsel shall stand, I will accomplish all my purpose, that God is in control of history. Even the most horrendous events in history, God has allowed those to occur for a purpose. Uh, which is an encouragement and a comfort to us to know that God's in control of everything from the smallest detail of our lives to the major events in history. So in this chapter, remember we're always doing fall in the first chapter, I'm sorry, creation in the first chapter, then fall. So now we're in the third chapter talking about redemption. The first section will talk about the appropriate means and motivations for establishing or refuting historical claims. So there are a lot of things that people claim to have happened in the past, and we have to talk about whether how we can show that those claims are right or how we can prove that certain claims are wrong. The second section will talk about how data from source materials should be humbly and honestly interpreted according to a viable model. And then finally, we'll defend the legitimacy of discerning divine providence in human history. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So 24.1, we're going to be talking about the appropriate means for establishing or refuting historical claims. And the two appropriate means are scholarly study of legitimate source materials through the interpretive lens of a biblical worldview. Then we'll talk about the appropriate motivations, which are two. We want to glorify God and we want to love others. So the first thing it starts off talking about are two guys, one guy named Samuel Johnson, who was trying to uh, refute the claim that matter didn't really exist. And he did it by kicking a rock and showing that there was a reaction. And then talks about Buzz Aldrin, who tried to uh, refute the claim that man had never landed on the moon. And basically talks about how when he was... Uh, 72, this guy who had been doing all these documentaries and constantly bugging people about having not landed on the moon, uh, put a mic in his face and told him to swear in the Bible that he landed on the moon. When he refused, the guy called him a coward, a liar, and a thief. So Buzz Aldrin punched him in the face. Uh, and it talks about how there are many people in the world today that want to refute historical claims. So they want to say that man never landed on the moon or they want to say that the Holocaust never happened. And how do we deal with people who want to refute historical claims? How do we defend them? And how do we know when there is a claim that people make that is not true, that didn't really happen? So the first thing we have to realize is that it's going to be based on our worldview. So the Christian worldview provides assurances that we can know certain things about history and it gives us a basic shape of that history. And that's what this whole course is about. Creation, fall, redemption gives us a framework which we can view all of history from and understand history from. So without that, the work of studying and writing history becomes aimless. Uh, really, there's no purpose for studying history or the purposes of wrong, uh, like showing that man is ultimate or that evolution is true or... Uh, that, like we talked about with Marxism, that all ever all of history is just a class struggle. So there really is only one way, though, to build reliable historical models, and that's hard work with the sources. A good historian is going to take an incredible amount of time and effort to make sure that he has completely read all of the sources that have to do with this topic he's studying and try to understand them and study them. That's the only way to really build historical models. And a lot of people come to wrong historical conclusions just because they don't want to do that work. So history is not simply a collation of facts which can be only be related together in one valid narrative. Uh, it's hard work. It's not just finding the facts and then writing them down. It's the hard work of putting those facts together into a model and different people will come to different models depending on the worldview, depending on which facts they look at, um, depending on sometimes the conclusions that they come to. So first of all, the historical evidence, the fundamental task of the historian obviously is to study the basic source materials of history. 
and there are several different source materials. We've already talked about this, so I'll go through this uh, a little bit more quickly. So the two major types are, first of all, you have the primary sources, which are uh, from that time period. It could be a journal, it could be a picture, it could be an archaeological thing. So to be able to, especially for ancient eras, eras, you have to understand the art and science of figuring out what artifacts belong to what historical layer. So for example, if I'm digging up Jericho, Jericho was built and destroyed many different times, and I have to figure out, does this pot belong to this era or the previous era? That's going to take a lot of time and careful study. So the research of some historians means reading countless letters and scraps from which they build a picture of the world. So historians, again, are going to use two major kinds of written sources. doesn't matter if this is an ancient thing from Aristotle or from World War II. They're going to use primary sources and secondary sources. Remember, a primary source is a source that comes from that period. So a pot from Aristotle's time or Aristotle's writings or uh, the, a building during Aristotle's time or let, a letter written to Aristotle, that's a primary source. Secondary source is going to rely on the historical evaluation and conclusions of others. So if I read a biography written in 1600 about Aristotle, that's a secondary source. It wasn't written during the time of Aristotle. So it's ran after. The primary sources are going to be better uh, because they will be written during that time. Those secondary sources can also be helpful. So worldview and history, scholarly history, historical work is to be done primarily on the level of primary sources. So if you become a historian, you're going to make most of your time reading the actual people who saw the events, not people who wrote about the people who saw the events. But even when you're dealing with primary sources, those primary sources are still going to be uh, flawed. Uh, for example, I just finished reading a book about missionaries who were spies during World War II. Now, obviously, reading primary sources by spies, you're going to have to read very carefully because spies are going to naturally want to lie about things or write things in uh, code or things like that. So just because they're primary sources doesn't mean it's always true. Um, obviously, also primary sources, people writing about their own lives or what they did are going to have bias and want to write about themselves, sometimes even lie about themselves. So the historian has to weigh the accuracy of each source. Uh, for all of his work, a Christian worldview is essential to be able to understand and put those together in a code. Uh, so the two purposes, the motivations for why we want to study and use history is number one, we want to glorify God. So Christians shouldn't be sloppy or lazy because we want to do our best and we want to show how God has worked through history. Uh, so Christian historians work to glorify God uh, like we read at the beginning in Isaiah 46, 9 through. The second thing is we want to help other people. So we've talked in the past about the benefits of studying history. Uh, and at, if we write and do good history, we can help push back against the direction, the bent direction of historical disciplines. So in the last chapter, we talked about how some hi historians are writing for their own purposes. We talked about Marxist history and Whig history and uh, gender history, how they overly focus on one aspect and many times misinterpret the data just to back up their bias. So good historians help people by doing several things. Number one, it lets dead people speak. What do I mean by that? Obviously, I'm not talking about zombies here. What I'm saying here is that people in the past many times are forgotten or misrepresented. And good historians properly represent people from the past. Uh, for example, let's say that you are involved in a major historical event and you die. You wouldn't want people 100 years from now misrepresenting your role in that historical event. And it's loving to the people, whether it's Abraham Lincoln, whether it's a slave in the 1800s, whether it's Aristotle, uh, whether it's the apostles, whether it is the Roman Catholic Church in the medieval era. Uh, it's loving to those people to correctly represent them. It also provides wisdom for us. We've talked about the different ways that that can help us. It frees us from conformity to this age. We talked about how many times we can believe a lot of things just because everyone around us believes it without even thinking about why we believe it. 
and understanding how different people in different eras thought helps us evaluate our own positions. So we can ask ourselves the questions, what stories do my neighbors need to hear? And by telling those stories, we can help people today. Um, so ideally, a Christian historian will be so rooted in what's truly important that he won't be knocked over by passing fads within his discipline. So we talked about before how many people today uh, just focus on what's popular instead of what's really needed. So a good historian won't just do what's popular, he will focus on events and on representing people in a way that will help people today. So that's 24.1. Uh, 24.2 is, uh, we've talked uh, about the fact that once you study the source materials, then you have to make a model. So in this section, we're going to talk about why a model is necessary. We're going to talk about what a good model, model is and what a bad model is. And then we're going to uh, talk about the need for both humility and honesty. So some examples of, of faulty models, it starts off talking about the fact that when you're a historian, you could read hundreds of letters, let's say from um, a battle during the Spanish-American War. And reading all of those letters and reports and even maybe getting digging up uh, artifacts, maybe finding sunken ships, that's just raw information. Then I have to take all of that information and put it together in a model that makes sense of that. Now, obviously that's gonna be really hard because history is very complex. In those letters, you're gonna have letters from Spaniards, you're gonna have letters from Americans, you're gonna have letters from generals and from soldiers, from kings and from peasants, and they're all gonna have different perspectives and many times contradicting views. And you have to put together why they would have said what they said and try to put all of those things together to understand what actually happened and why it happened. So, they have to use a model to explain all of that raw information. So we talked in a previous section about the Victorian religion and how some historians today want to emphasize during the Victorian era that there were all these people that were doubting religion. Uh, but then we also talked about how other historians have come in and said, yes, though people have doubted, much more people believed, and even a lot of the people that doubted actually returned to belief. Uh, so instead of being really a crisis of faith, you can use that to show that many of those people actually returned to faith and it was still a very religious time. Uh, another one that it mentions is missionaries and how uh, many people point out today that during the time of European colonial, colonialism when people, uh, countries like Britain and France and the Netherlands were conquering other countries, uh, many times missionaries would come in with their empires and they, many people want to say today that the, all those missionaries uh, basically ended up helping their countries dominate the cultures and destroy the cultures and had a very detrimental effect on those cultures. And in many times that was true, uh, but a more closely researched um, position of that era era shows that the one the missionaries that did work with the state to hurt the um, populations were the ones that were part of state churches but not all missionaries were part of state churches not all missionaries were associated with the government many missionaries were actually working against the state and were independent churches and those missionaries many times actually exposed the state's abuse of the people uh, for example, there were many missionaries that smuggled pictures of abuses out of the Congo. Um, missionaries in South Africa uh, spearheaded an agreement to protect the people um, in Botswana from other land grabs. Uh, many of them taught the people how to read and how to defend themselves and oppose those injustices. So he came up with a more balanced approach uh, to this by really studying sources. Now, we have to always have humility when we study these sources and come up with conclusions for two reasons. Uh, first of all, we have to realize that many times uh, Christians did bad things. And pretty much every person in history did bad things because every person in history was a sinner. 
So a real, truly Christian worldview perspective of history doesn't say all the Christians were the good guys and everyone else was the bad guys. A Christian perspective, just like the Bible, realizes that even the best Christians made some really poor choices. So when we study people like Martin Luther, we can say, yes, he did really good things with the Reformation and, and pushing back against the church. But especially later on in life, he was very anti-Semitic. He, he made some very poor choices and did some very evil things. So when we look at history, the first thing that we have to be humble about is realizing that a lot of history shows the sinfulness even in Christians and even in good Christians. So we have to be willing to point out the flaws even in the people that support our position and point out that they were evil. And really that supports the Christian worldview because it shows that everyone is a sinner. The Christian worldview doesn't say that all Christians are going to be perfect. It says that all Christians are going to be sinners. And pointing out the flaws and even the best Christians uh, backs up the Christian worldview. But it takes humility uh, to point out that even good Christians made evil choices. The second reason why it requires humility is that we as people are fallen. And we're going to make mistakes. And many times we're going to overlook evidence or let our bias um, make the evidence be distorted. And we have to be willing to change our models when we are confronted with that and we come up with new evidence. So the second thing, we have to be humble, uh, both because we can show that our position, people that have held our position were flawed and make wrong choices. And secondly, we have to be humble uh, because we realize that we are fallen and we're going to many times make mistakes in our historical work. Uh, the second thing we need is not only humility, but we also need honesty. So as historians, we should be objective. But objective is not the same thing as being neutral. We talked about this back in the first unit. It's impossible to be neutral. No one is neutral. Everyone has presuppositions. Everyone is either going to believe in supernatural or not believe in supernatural. Believe in God or not believe in God, and, and many other presuppositions that can't be proved. And we have to have those presuppositions because without them, we can't understand anything. But we have to admit our presuppositions, and we can't let our presuppositions make us purposefully distort the evidence. So objectivity is admitting our presuppositions and not letting those presuppositions make us distort the evidence. So objectivity doesn't mean that the historian doesn't try to marshal support only for his position he wants to be true. Objectivity means he tries to find the truth, even if that truth seems to go against what he wants. So Carl Truman says it's actually the duty of a historian when he postulates a certain thesis to make a special effort to find evidence that would call his theory into question. This is really hard to do because naturally we always want to find historical evidence to support our position. But if we are true Christians and we want to find the truth, not just what backs us up, and we should be actually looking for things that would go against us, uh, that is what a truthful historian does. Finally, the last section, our objectives are to define providence and defend its reality in human experience. Explain the objections to discerning divine providence in human history, um, except outside of specific biblical revelation. And then explain guidelines and limitations for properly discerning human history. So moralities and political views have differed significantly over time. But so this ought to lead to more humility on the part of historian to realize that many times uh, we are blinded by our culture and the time in which we live. And just like we are blinded, people in other time periods could also be blind. So a biblical worldview roots all moral evaluations, of course, in scripture. So we compare the choices of people and evaluate whether they're right or wrong, not based on whether they agree on what the culture thinks is right and wrong today, but whether or not they agree with scripture. That standard is always the same for every period in history today or a thousand years ago. Scripture is a standard for what is right or wrong. But as we study past events, realizing how our cultural moment skews our views, we have to realize that people in that time period also were skewed. 
So when we write about people like, say, for example, Abraham Lincoln, and we see that even though he did a lot of good, even in his good, he still was making statements that we would disagree with today. But we have to realize and give him a, a little kindness because of the era in which he was writing. He was very going against his era, uh, but he was still influenced by his era. So we point out what he did in saying this and that was wrong, but we do it understanding uh, the, the time period. So discerning divine providence, providence is the theological term designating God's control over and direction of human affairs. So providence means God's in control. God's in control of everything. The Bible teaches that God is in control of every single event in history. From the Holocaust to the sinking of the Armada, God is in control of everything. So some Christian historians think that for various reasons a Christian should avoid discussing providence. And there are two reasons, Carl Truman points out two reasons. Number one, uh, everything is providence. The Christian believes every event is providence. So why should we say this event or that event was providential if everything is providence? The second reason they say we shouldn't talk about providence is because most people, when they use providence, they only talk about providence when it supports their views. So they say, oh, God was working in this situation because it supports my views, but he wasn't working in this situation. So does that mean we should just throw out providence? Well, there are problems with saying certain events are providential. Uh, again, some historians point to anything, for example, that promotes American freedoms and say that that was God's providence. So God is the one that allowed us to conquer the West and uh, destroy the Indians. Therefore, that was right. Or just because God allowed it doesn't mean it was right. C.S. Lewis warns of the dangers of ascribing our calamities, or more often our neighbor's calamities, to divine judgment. So saying that the Spanish lost because God was judging them, or we won because God was using us to judge them, we have to be careful with that. Unless uh, this limitation. Should not prevent historians of God. So writing and teaching, the two most common ways for a historian to communicate his research are through teaching and writing. And hopefully some of you will end up doing that. Uh, writing can be published in scholarly journals or just in books that everyone would read. Uh, whether those books are for scholarly or purposely, that is written for people who aren't specialists. So maybe God will call some of you to be historians. And when you do that, you should always do that through the lens of the biblical worldview, thinking about what we've talked about in this chapter.